Welcome to Hardware Addicts, a proud member of the Destination Linux Network. Hardware Addicts is the podcast that focuses on the physical components that power our technology world. In this episode, we're going to discuss a phone in which the previous model had all of us geek enthusiasts drooling, but now that same company has launched a new version of this phone, and we're going to see if we're still going to be getting geek chills on this Android beast because they've thrown everything into this device. Also, we discussed the new AMD GPU and ask ourselves, why the heck would anyone want this? Could anybody even get this? But then we're going to head over to the camera corner where Wendy will discuss our DSLRs dying. So sit back, relax, plug in, because Hardware Addict starts now. I'm Ryan, your tech guide through the universe, and with me today are my two co-hosts, Wendy, a resident photographer extraordinaire and hardware enthusiast, along with Michael, the software sage, and still, hardware padawan. Let's find out what tech adventures everyone has had this week. Michael, what have you been doing, man? So I have been working on a bunch of stuff, but I wanted to play with something, and I because I already had it, and I just had an idea that maybe this would work. So I did an experiment with a convergence dock of the Pine Phone. So the Pine Phone, pe people may or may not have heard of it. It's getting popular uh, in all sorts of different tech world, but it's a an enthusiast phone for Linux based phones, and it is really cool. But there's a version that you can buy that comes with a convergence dock, which is essentially a USB T USB C dock that attaches to your phone that has USB output, it uh, like USB A options. It also has ports for HDMI out and also an Ethernet jack. So I decided, will, will this convergence dock work on an Android phone? And it turns out, yes. In fact, because I have a Samsung, you can use this dock to activate DeX. So by plugging in, plugging in the dock, hooking up the HDMI, it will activate the DeX automatically. And then you can plug in a mouse or a keyboard and the Ethernet. And it also has this uh, USB-C power pass-through. So it will charge your phone through that pass-through dock uh, port which is really cool. And uh, I was just I was just wondering if it would work because it was not made for those devices. Look at you and doing hardware experiments totally and stuff, like a that real is. hardware addict. Yeah, I'm working on getting away from that Padawan title. I like it. I like it. Now, I got a question yeah. for you. I, I was so excited about Samsung DeX back in the day because they were going to use a Linux desktop. In fact, you could play with the experimental Linux desktop from your phone. So when you would dock it, you would you could display on your monitor and you would have a full kind of Linux desktop there that you could play with and do your development work or whatever in. They did away with the Linux portion. So what's left of Dex? Like, is it any good? Well, it's basically just a glorified Android screen. So it's just like a like a 1080p full screen Android experience. Essentially, it doesn't have the same like the wallpapers different. So it's not the it's not just taking your phone and blowing it up. It's a different in, in experience, it's a different interface, but it's mostly the same thing. So if you open an app on the Dex, it will just display it in the same form factor that the app. So it's kind of like turning your phone. phone into a Chromebook. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it depends it on the device. With everything it already There's has. a little more functionality on my on my Samsung tablet. It also has Dex, and you can tweak that to where it has more of a standard desktop look with a close and a minimize type button, but I would still say it is very Chromebook-esque in its usage or in its kind of feel. It opens the applications as if it's a window like a desktop, so it does right. do that, but it's also in some of the applications, if those apps don't support full screen, it just won't allow you to do full screen. Gotcha. So it just kind of, just it just gives it in the same form factor if you would have on the phone anyway, and it's worse by a lot because if you have the an application that doesn't support the full screen, it also probably won't support scrolling. So the touchpad, I couldn't figure out how to make it work. Maybe I just didn't do it the right gestures or whatever. But it wouldn't let me scroll on one of the applications when I was in the Dex. This is why so they should bring back the Linux desktop experiment they were doing. It got me to go out and buy one of these phones and the dock for that matter to go play with it years ago. It's a shame they got rid of it because it's just not yeah, sure. Doesn't sound it sounds okay, but it's not. If you're opening apps in the same form factor that you would on your phone and stuff, certain apps that would be pretty frustrating. Yeah, it, it's not as good as it could be, 
Um, I think they just don't put a lot of attention to it, but it is, and at least it's a funny thing to play with, but it's not something I would use any long period of time because for it to work, you still need a separate keyboard attached to right. it and you still might need as well a dock, just get a laptop. Course. Yeah, pretty much at that point, it's not that much better than just having, I mean, it, even a tablet would be a kind of a better experience because you at least get a bigger screen yeah. and you can still use touch functionality because it does have this thing where you can turn your screen into a touchpad. And it does work with most of the touch functions, but not all applications work with the like this uh, two finger scrolling or. And I think development wise anymore, they really are focusing on their tablets and specifically the models where they have a keyboard built to go with it, like the model that I have. I wouldn't say it's the best experience ever. And when I do connect my keyboard to it, I typically don't turn on Dex because I'm already in the application that I need to be typing or whatever in. So. It hasn't been a key feature for me on that device. Yeah. Well, I will say that's what's cool about this uh, convergence dock thing that I got from the Pine phone that when I connected it, if you don't connect the HDMI, it will still allow you to use whatever you connect to it as, you know, when you do. So if you connect a physical keyboard to the, do- the dock, even though you don't have HDMI, it will still use that keyboard on the regular operating system in general. Then if it only, re- it only activates DEX when you plug in an HDMI cable. Interesting. Well, Wendy, what experiments have you been running this week? I drug my husband to town this last weekend. And when we were cruising pawn shops, I found a used, so new to me, Samsung Galaxy Watch. I've been using a Fitbit Versa 2 for just over a year now. And to be honest, I've hated the thing. Absolutely hated it. And I've been a pretty Hmm. big fan of smartwatches. So my Huawei watch, I'd had like since it released, I pre-ordered that one. I'd held an LG watch before that and had really enjoyed the smartwatch ecosystem and mainly the way that I could keep my phone away from me, but still answer calls, see who's calling, see what notifications are coming in and not have to have my phone on me all the time. Well, for the last year, the Fitbit has been great as a health monitoring workout type tracking device. But as a smartwatch, the Fitbit Versa 2 is absolute garbage, complete and total garbage. Well, for the most part, I was getting my notifications sometimes for the last two months, definitely since this last update, I've not been getting any notifications for calls at all. And I keep my phone itself on silent all the time because I want those notifications to come to my watch. So as I am listening to a book, listening to music or whatever else is going on my phone, none of that is getting interrupted, but I can still have access to all of that stuff. And the quote unquote smartwatch from Fitbit has not been living up to that. Even more so, I haven't been able to control my audiobooks. It has a Spotify application that most of the time won't connect and I was done. So when I saw this Galaxy Watch there, I jumped on the opportunity to have a real smartwatch again. <laughs> have you have you been with the, the Galaxy Watch? So far, I've actually really been liking it. It's the first time I've used one of the Samsung style smartwatches. And I have to say it's super satisfying to get that little click as you spin the top bezel around to go between the different widgets, widgets or through your notifications. The screen has been nice and clear. Everything's running great. Music's working. I can start and stop my books. I can answer calls. I'm actually getting call notifications. That part's been great. It still has the sleep tracking. So if you want to wear that when you sleep and see how well you're sleeping, usually it tells me, congratulations, you know you slept like crap and we're here to show you you did. (laughs) So, so far, it's been a great watch. I've only had it for a few days. We'll continue to see how well it's doing. Battery life's been pretty good. That was one thing I do have to say that was nice on the Fitbit. The battery really lasted a long time. So we'll see as this time goes on. But so far, it's been a really good purchase. My husband's been happy because he doesn't have to call me three times and then send me a text message for me to know that he's trying to get a hold of me. You know, a smartwatch can be super useful. I used to kind of balk at it until... I finally found one. I could not find one in the Android family that I liked. It was either a privacy policy issue, which to me, the Galaxy Watch has a 
back when I looked through their privacy policy, it was sell your information, display you ads, you know, customized ads, that type of stuff, which frustrated me. So the Apple Watch is what I use and the fitness and, of course, the health pieces that they do, which actually the health portions of the Apple Watch are open source, which is interesting. So uh, one of the few things Apple does that are open source. But the privacy is a big issue with a lot of these watches out there. Um, But none of them have done it anywhere close to the Apple Watch, which frustrates me because Android should be able to do it, especially a Samsung watch with a Samsung phone, because you can't really use the closed garden argument there because you're basically saying, hey, I'm pairing it with the company that made this. It should work perfect between the two. Uh, Fitbit was kind of the same. Their privacy policy was a huge issue for me uh, to utilize it. So it's an interesting world because it's a super useful technology. It's definitely helped me stay more fit. It does a lot of things. These watches telling you when to, you know, make sure you take a breath to get up and stand to not sit too long, tracks your steps, all of this cool stuff gives you notifications. So if your phone's not on you and you've got important business work, you kind of still get dinged for me, turn by turn directions. It'll actually vibrate and things when it's time to turn. So even if the kids are yelling and you can't hear that you were supposed to turn, your watch notifies you a lot of cool stuff in them. But they really got to work on that privacy policy issue. Yeah, absolutely. That is definitely an issue for a lot of these. I know Samsung isn't using Android Wear. I think that's what they're calling it these days. It's not using that anymore. It is Tizen now. And I know in the past there's also been some compatibility issues between the Samsung Watch and phones that are not. I think they've kind of worked a lot of those out. We'll see how it goes. I think it's one of those pieces of hardware that if more people tried, they'd realize that smart wearables are kind of a handy thing to have. I think that it would be a more useful tool than maybe some of the glasses and that type of stuff we've talked about because it's just on your wrist. This one is also LTE enabled. So I do not have a SIM card for it, but I could get one and then be completely and totally phone free if I wanted to for a time. Very nice. So, Ryan, what do you have going on this week? Well, a couple things. You know, I've been on this HP kick ever since I found out that they're kind of the best company when it comes to not using slave force or child labor in their supply chain. So a lot of videos out there on a couple of HPs that I have my got my hands on that we've talked about. I also got my hands on this week an HP Omen, which is their gaming lineup. And so I've been playing with that this week and I'll be doing some videos on that. And I'll talk about it in the next episode because I want some more time to play with it. But it's pretty fire. It's pretty awesome. What the, There's another gadget that I got my hands on that I do want to talk about. I actually got this for my daughter. She was watching some YouTube videos and there was a person using a pen based 3D printer. So this is a pen shaped device, obviously much thicker than a pen. You feed your filament through the top. And it heats up just like a 3D printer would. And it has an extractor in there that's pulling down the filament down into the bottom of the pen. And you print just like a 3D printer, except layer by layer with a pen like you're drawing. And you can set the amount of the filament that comes out at a time. So if you want it to go faster or slower, depending on what you're building. And it's just been a really cool little device. Now, the one that I got is this is a terrible name. MYNT, I think that's a mint, maybe 3D professional printing 3D pen with an OLED display in it. Very unique device. My daughter has had a blast with it, making different animals and heart shapes and things like that. Obviously, it dries very quick, like a 3D printer does when it's completed, and you can kind of peel it off the surface that you're using, and you have a little 3D version of whatever your drawing is. Just a really cool device to check out if you're not ready yet to maybe go for the full 3D printer, spend all of that money. You can pick one of these up, maybe for the kids and things, and still get them used to that technology out there. I just thought it's one of the coolest things and not very expensive either, considering what you pay for, you know, a full size 3D printer. You can pick this up for 60 bucks. Wow. Oh, that's cool. So this is kind of like free freehand drawing a 3D printing thing. Yeah, it's just freehand drawing. Now, I do recommend that you don't use the ABS plastic. If you look through the comments, you'll notice a lot of people talking about the ABS plastic kind of jamming. Um, So 
utilize the PLA plastic, which is lower temperature, 175 degrees, and you could set the temperature on the device. You could use either plastic, but I've had zero issues with the PLA plastic, which is also what I use in my 3D printer. And it's just a really fun device for the kids. Now, obviously, you got to know your own kids. Uh, my daughter's only seven, but very responsible, really listens to directions really well. So stays away from that hot end, which is replaceable, which is really cool as well. So you can kind of repair the thing. But if you have kids that are really rowdy and like to, you know, jab things at people, it's probably not the best thing to get them yet. Uh, but it's very cool. Something you can do with your kids during the pandemic or where you're at home or just a new way of doing art. Yeah, it reminds me of a hot glue gun mat or kind of mixed together with your 3D printer. It kind of is. That's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah, but instead of, you know, the clear glue and things, you you have different colors and you can replace the colors as you're printing. So if you want a multicolored piece of art that you're doing, you can pull in, put in the gray plastic or purple plastic and start the heart out. And then you could extract that piece of the plastic, put the different color in and continue drawing. And so you can have mixed colors and different things you can do with it. Really, really cool device. This episode of Hard Radix is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their app platform service, which is a solution to build modern cloud native apps. With App Platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. You simply point your GitHub or GitLab repository to let the App Platform do all the heavy lifting for you. And they also do high scalability and zero infrastructure management. And what does that mean? Well, by simply pointing it from your GitHub or your GitLab repository, you can let it do all the stuff like handling infrastructure, like app runtimes and dependencies. So all you have to do is push code and then it will just start running. And in fact, it runs with little to no customization because the app platform uses cl open cloud native standards. So you can automatically analyze your code, create containers and run them on Kubernetes clusters. It has support for multiple programming languages like Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby. Plus, it also has support for static sites, Docker, and container images. As a listener of the Hardware Addicts podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Well, actually better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 free credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's app platform. I want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Hardware Addicts. So this week, we're going to be covering our Asus ROG 5. We originally covered the ROG series, the ROG 2, in episode 5 of Hardware Addicts. So you're going to have to go back and check that out, where we pitted it against the Samsung S20. And we all were drooling over this phone, because back then, it still had some of the best hardware you could get slammed into a device. Right. Well... They released this latest version, and it is just as daring, just as unique as that phone now. They have several versions. I'm going to focus on the Ultimate because it's obviously the Ultimate Edition, and there are other editions that have less RAM and things like that, but we're going to focus on the best of the best here in, in this episode. As a hardware addict would do. That makes sense. It makes sense, right? So the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888. 18 gigabytes of LP DDR5 RAM. That's right. Eight. Wait, did you say this is a phone? <laughs> this is a phone. This has oh, more right. RAM than most laptops that people buy out there. 18 gigabytes of RAM. It's nuts. 512 gigabytes of UFS storage, 3.1. It's universal flash storage. 300 hertz, hertz touch sampling rate and 144 hertz screen with one millisecond AMOLED display. So basically this, what you're saying is that they've taken basically a full-size ARM laptop and shrunk it to phone size? Exactly. Then, honestly, <laughs> this is better than most laptops out there that are <laughs> ARM-based as well. You get a 6,000 milliamp hour battery in there, Wi-Fi 6E, and it features a flagship Sony IMX686 64 megapixel main wide-angle camera, an ultra-wide 13 megapixel second camera, and a macro camera. Literally. All the cool stuff, somebody was sitting there on a bench full of cool phone parts and was like, yeah, all of it, all of it. Stuff it all in. <laughs> yeah, get it all in it's there. Like, we don't have an 18 gig. Make it. <laughs> Make it. Figure out a way to get 18 <laughs> gigabytes of RAM into a phone because reasons. So <laughs> this thing is clearly a beast in the spec department. It just knocks it out of the park in the specs. Good luck competing with it. It's in a world all on its own in the Android ecosystem anyways. 
as far as the camera goes, I was curious, Wendy, comparing this to the iPhone 12 Pro, iPhone, pretty much every new phone is just an upgraded camera at this point. Do you see anything in here that makes you go one would be better than the other? There's a little bit of difference between the two. So as I'm looking at the specs, one of the things I'm looking at here is the wide angle lens, the wide lens. That's the one that'll give you 64 megapixels on the ROG phone and 12 megapixels on the iPhone 12 Max. The iPhone will let in just a little bit more light. It has a 1.6 aperture, whereas Asus phone has a 1.8. There really is a minimal difference between the two. The other thing I'm looking at is pixel size. So the Asus phone or the ROG phone has a 0.8 micron. I mean, these see the absolutely tiny pixel size and you have a larger pixel on the iPhone 12 which is 1.4 microns between the two that's really a big difference so when it comes to overall sharpness of the image I'd probably go ahead and give it to the iPhone just looking at the specs and not seeing images between the two because of the larger pixel size of the iPhone it's like we talked about previously. If you have a bigger bucket, it's easier to catch light and have things not go off to the sides. So I'm a little curious as to what pixel pitch is. And if you remember from a previous episode, pixel pitch is how close those pixels are together. If they're really close together, then you're not losing much information between those pixels. But if there is a larger pixel pitch, then not only do you have a smaller bucket to fill, you also have bigger gaps between them. So I'm a little curious as to where that is on both devices. The other thing that I noticed is camera features. The iPhone gives you raw support and the ROG phone does not. So if you want any in-depth customizations. You really want to see those pictures as they're shot and make some maybe dramatic tweaks. The iPhone is going to be best for that. Overall, I think this phone is made for gaming on and not necessarily for shooting pictures on, but they throw some major specs in there to make it look good. Very interesting. Man, I love having you on the show, wow. Wendy. I love having you yeah. on the show because I would not have been able to Take a look sense. at those and understand the difference. I've been like 64 megapixels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 64. <laughs> Whoa, 64. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, right? You mentioned the software and things that are obviously how fast it's able to take the pictures. There's a bunch of other factors that could go into right. this. But from a pure spec sheet readout, it's a good camera overall for a camera and a phone. Maybe not the i12 Pro level but it's a decent camera and you were dead on when you said hey this is more of a gaming phone and when you look at the specs right the touch sampling rate very important if you're going to game on a phone the 144 hertz display the giant battery because you know how fast your battery wears down anyways let alone when you're gaming but they also add a bunch of accessories as well like the aero active cooler 5 clip-on external cooling fan oh that's so cool <laughs> have a cooling fan i mean really phone, if man. you have that much going on inside this tiny little device, extra cooling has got to be a must for it. And this is not yeah. like some joke thing where you clip it on like, you know, just to look cool. Like this thing actually shows that it reduces the CPU's temperature by 15 degrees. That's a pretty big deal. 15 degrees. Nice. Yeah. You know, you have a powerful phone when it requires an extra fan on the back. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh, I just love the ROG lineup. I want one of these phones so bad. I just wish it didn't have Android on it personally. But the other thing that this cooler does is it also has two extra physical buttons on it. So, yes, you have to slap this extra device on your phone. But it also has additional buttons on it so you can get your game on and... It has a kickstand built into it as well. So you've got your cooling on and this one little clip on device. You've got two extra buttons so you can totally no scope 360 kill Michael and any of the games you're playing there. And you For get a kickstand. Sure. <laughs> and a kickstand. And a kickstand. Yeah. The cool Perfection. thing about it, I think it's really cool that this whole this whole thing, it's got so many like 
interesting concepts put into a phone. When they when we first talked about the ROG 2, it was like, this is kind of a ridiculous phone, but it looks kind of cool. And you can see that they were going for that market. But this one is it's like to an extreme level powerful and putting the fan on it to make the gaming performance even better and lower the CPU uh, heat is such an interesting, I, I, I'm not sure exactly who this is for. Cause it's like, Me. is it for in super enthusiast? I mean, <laughs> sure. I think it'd be great, but I'm also, I, I, I don't need that much. Well, I'm, I'm not I'm done yet. Let me see computer. if I could sell you when I keep going here. Rear touch sensors on the back of the ROG five phone ultimate give you an L2 and R2 trigger function, Michael. Just okay, like a is, game console controller. That is kind of cool. So the phone itself is also got like capacitive touches or something. Yes. And ultrasonic sensors as well built into this phone. How about this? Maybe you're not. Maybe the gaming things. Eh, how about a game FX audio system built into the phone? How about seven magnet dual mm. speakers that are front firing PC manufacturers of laptops? All the big ones out there. They can't barely get this right in a giant laptop, but they got it right in the ROG front firing speakers. Imagine that. Seriously. That is really cool. I like the, the front firing speakers on the fo- on a phone is interesting because that's very rare for phones. You know, Absolutely. it's very rare for a lot of devices, even most tablets, that kind of thing. It's really hard to find anything with front front firing speakers, which is absolutely horrible. The last tablet that I owned that I absolutely love, and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it here before was the NVIDIA... Shield? Yes, the NVIDIA Shield. I absolutely loved that tablet. And when it died, I nearly cried. Yeah, a lot of people love the NVIDIA Shield stuff, for sure. And it had those front-firing speakers, and that's one of the things that I think was the highlight of that device. Yep. Okay, so additional... I, I have to assume... If this is a, it's got something you said that game FX audio system. It has to have more than just speakers. What makes it game FX like to be so good that it needs its own naming scheme? Well, obviously you've got the seven magnet dual speakers. So this is a lot of speaker power into a phone, but they've also optimized it in collaboration with audio specialist direct. So you've got this amazing sound that's been perfectly programmed for the device so you're hearing the people walk up around you you're getting that surround sound effect and things going on 3.5 millimeter headphone jack yes they have a headphone (gasps) jack that is so (laughs) awesome i use my headphone jack on my phone all the time if you listen to the last deal and extend you've heard me say that this week i love the 3.5 millimeter jack i cannot have a phone without one Thank you. You've put a total package together here. I look like an idiot most of the time when I'm just, well, I just look like an idiot most of the time, but I look like an extra special (laughs) idiot most of the time when I'm out with a phone, right, that has a headphone jack because I carry a DAC around in my pocket when I have, because I have very high-end headphones, but not with this phone. You wouldn't need that because they built in a hi-fi grade ESS DAC for lossless audio processing in this as well. So if wow. you have high-end headphones, it's going to power them. It's going to make your music sound beautiful. Okay, you're you're convincing me now to really want this. Like I I'm a big fan of high-quality audio and this I mean the powerful foam parts of it is already cool, but this is this is getting there. And then cuz they they would be ridiculous if we stopped now. They put a customizable mini LED screen on the back to personalize it so you can scroll words on it. You can uh, make fun of people as you're walking by them in Starbucks and they have their iPhones Done. on it. You can take my money. <laughs> take my money. Yes, we did a take my money episode. I mean, it's just they kind of packed a little bit of everything. I really feel like this is the future. A Nintendo Switch built into your phone. It's absolutely a piece of art when you look at this device. Every detail there is gorgeous. One thing I'll mention is that I do have issues with Asus's supply chain because I've talked about this in the past weeks, along with Google's supply chain, for that matter, that makes the OS. And there's specific allegations out there of Google having the forced labor in there and stuff like that. So this is a problem that would keep me from buying the phone. I hope that they can clean up their supply chain and get the stuff out of there because it really takes away from amazing technology like this. And I also hope that we get a third operating system choice out there for the phones, a mainstream one 
that people can utilize and not have to worry about their privacy and other things, which Web is a big OS. issue I have with Android. Web OS. Web OS. Web OS. <laughs> exactly. <If> Web OS <laughs> could make a comeback. Wouldn't that be beautiful? But overall, if we're just looking at the hardware here, it's quite an amazing accomplishment. They've put a lot into this device. I think somebody who picked it up, if you're big into gaming on mobile, maybe your kids are big into gaming on mobile, you're going to have a good time with this phone. I think it's pretty cool. And I like that they're doing something different because gosh knows that the phone market suffers terribly from this copy syndrome. And I don't care who copied who first. They're all just copying each other. They all look the dang well same now and they're boring. This is the first phone in a long time that just doesn't look boring. And it probably comes with a charger. Probably. <laughs> probably. All right. And then we're going to hit a quick news item. You know, I love my AMD out there. I'm a huge fanboy of AMD. AMD has just been killing it lately. And they had a big GPU announcement this week. The 6700 XT. This new GPU that nobody will ever be able to get their hands on anyway. So why spend too much time talking what do you mean? About you it. could totally get it. You just need to go to the land of Narnia, and there's tons of them there. <laughs> there's no stock, and AMD releases a, I don't know what to call this. Quote, unquote, releases? Yeah, releases it this released thing the that idea. <laughs> maybe it's like winning the lottery. You got to buy a, a secret ticket. Uh, if you unwrap a candy bar and you have the golden wrapper, you might get one type of thing. I don't know. You know. In my dream world, I get a new graphics card every night. I like that. <laughs> you know what? I like it. You just make up your own universe in which <laughs> graphic cards are a plenty. They rain down from the sky. Well, you could compare this to the 6800 XT. Since we're in Playland, I guess we should pretend that we'll go through the specs here just real quick. Uh, not that anybody could get one, but in theory, if you could, it's 12 gigabytes of GDR6 instead of 16 on the 6800 XT. Memory bus is 192 bit instead of 256 bit, and the bandwidth goes from 512 gigabytes on the 6800 XT down to 384 on this new 6700 XT. So the price should be the big winner here, at least in theory. That's $479, which is $100 cheaper than the 6800 XT. That is, if you could ever find one, anyways. What well, else is, I mean, that doesn't sound that much better anyway. If you could get it at retail price, you're saving $100 compared to, you know, you're getting four gigs of less of the G GDDR6 and you're getting like, what's the point? Like if I just pay an extra $100 and get the. There, the there really is no point to this card. In fact, a lot of people are really confused by this release. I suspect in, in, in my opinion that this was just, hey, we had some extra yields here, poorer yields that couldn't quite make the 6800 XT. So let's release a 6700 XT and, you know, people will buy it anyways because they're going to buy anything we put out there. So just throw it out on the market because this is not a decent card by any stretch of the imagination. You can get an RTX 3060. It's going to have better overall performance. There are some cases in which this new card is faster in some applications, but overall you're going to have a better time with the 3060 ti in theory if you could actually get one of those or the 3070 for that matter for 4.99 uh in this alternate universe where you could actually get one of these cards you could that would be a better choice i think as well in the nvidia lineup whether gaming or for workloads like animation or rendering it's kind of just a dog it's laughable it's not the amd i like it's not the amd i want to talk about and they're doing nothing about the crypto issue at all. And I know a lot of people were saying, well, there's really not much they could do. I think they could have done some cues. I think they could have at least given people with an account that have ordered, you know, single items here and there before a chance, done some type of lottery. I don't know, done something to actually give a chance for people yeah. who are computer builders and enthusiasts out there a chance to get this card. Because I know short term, everybody's saying, well, they're making so much money, they don't even care. But here's what happens. Crypto, which I invest in, eventually always crashes. And when it does, all of these cards from all of these miners are going to flood the used market. And AMD and NVIDIA are still going to be producing new cards like MAD, having these factories run at full speed with a 
ton of supply hitting the shelves. Nobody's going to be buying because everybody's going to be getting it for half off from the miners who are now selling all their cards because this exact same thing happened before. It's going to happen again. So I think they should actually take this seriously and either create a miner specific card that's just for them so they'll leave our stuff alone or do some type of lottery system or something to fix this because ultimately while it's sweet and fun now in the paradise world of every card you basically manufacture is sold at some point they're going to flood the market even if they can't even if they fail miserably when they try to do something about it it's just the effort of trying is at least a valuable th- an effort. Like just we know that you you recognize the problem and you're going to do something about it. But just to pretend that it'll go away at some point, it will go away as soon as all the cards flood the market, like you said. So yeah, yeah, it'll go away then, and then you'll be in a much worse situation. I agree. This is bad news, and look, it has me excited for one company out there, and that's Intel to see what they can bring to the GPU market. I know that they have a couple of different versions of their cards that they're looking at releasing and being rumored to be released. It would be exciting to see a company like Intel come in here right now where NVIDIA and AMD have been so weak in this game of controlling this issue and see if they could do something to make people fans of their work. Every issue like this creates an opportunity for another company. I think Intel should strike while the iron's hot. This episode of Hardware Addicts is sponsored by Bitwarden. Bitward is the password manager that we use and trust. Bitwarden lets you set up things like a pin to easily access your password manager, as well as additional authentications, such as master passwords and adding phrases to fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync their sensitive data. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust because it is 100% open source. You can self-host it, plus they do security audits, which and they share all of that information with you. Go to bitwarden.com slash GLN to get started for free. Want that premium account that starts at just $10 per year? You get one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, and Duo, Vault Health Reports, TOTP authenticator storage and generation, plus priority customer service. Make the smart move like many of those from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. If you're like me though, you'll want to show off your appreciation by signing up for that premium edition, especially since that edition starts at just $10 per year. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of Hardware Addicts. Okay, Wendy, take us into the camera corner and tell us, are DSLRs dying? There has been some theories floating in the camera community for a few years now that the DSLRs are dying since mirrorless cameras in particular are getting so popular and so good. In the beginning of mirrorless, that screen was really choppy. It had a hard time keeping up and any more You really can't tell the difference between looking through the viewfinder of a DSLR compared to looking through one on a mirrorless camera. I came across this article that just recently dropped, and it was talking about that Canon and Nikon, the biggest makers of DSLRs still, are starting to discontinue certain lenses, specifically the really expensive ones for DSLRs from their lineup. So I'm curious as to what you think that sounds like, Ryan. Why would they do that? Well, I mean, obviously you have two companies here that are both rumored at discontinuing these very expensive lenses. I would have to think these would be very big money makers for them. They're not just increasing the cost of them. They're already, what, four or $5,000 lenses, some of these ones that are listed here in the article. I really think that they're in big trouble. I I think the whole camera market, frankly, is in a little bit of trouble, a little bit, because you're in a situation where when I was growing up, my parents would go and spend a 
good amount of money that they had saved up to go get a camera to take pictures of kids and events and things like that. But when you go to these events today, nobody, for the most part, every once in a while you may see somebody are bringing those type of cameras. Nobody's going to buy them. When you go to your superstores and they have the camera section there, it's usually the aisle you can go down if you need to quickly get to the other side of the store because nobody's in that aisle. Now, that's not to say they don't sell professional cameras. Obviously, there's professional photographers out there and they're needed for special events, weddings, these type of things, obviously marketing, advertising, filmmaking, all of this stuff exists. But from a consumer standpoint, I think we've all moved to our phones. That's our camera. And there are people obviously who get into the hobby and want something better and certainly can get much better pictures than that. So I think that's one thing that's impacting the camera market is the phone market has taken a lot of that away. So now what they're left with is more of your enthusiast, hobbyist, and professional line, which is really surprising to me that they would start taking away the professional. And I have to agree with you that I think a lot of this has to do with the mirrorless coming in and kind of taking that market. And probably they're going to be shifting a lot of their focus into that mirrorless world. I have a question. It's kind yeah. of it's kind of similar to this this topic and the the aspect. I think that it makes sense for them to... Uh, get rid of the lenses if they're going to just transition to mirrorless as a as a goal and a focus because i mean the biggest thing that sony has in terms of cameras is their mirrorless cameras and they're getting everybody talking about them and canon and nikon are not are they're kind of like you know they're still in like a, a legacy aspect of people talking about them where if they were to do this switch to mi mirrorless they might get that market share back to at least to a degree so maybe DSLRs are dying, but not like professional cameras are dying. Cause I agree that the, it makes sense that the mass majority of people would be using their phones because they don't really care that much about having the highest quality photos. But I do think that the professional level cameras are still very important. Like we, we both purchased my, myself and Ryan both purchased cameras that are on the professional level tier for webcams for the podcasting and videos and stuff like that, but they were both mirrorless. So is it possible that the mirrorless is just going, is just, they're doing it for that purpose to transition to mirrorless. And as an aside note, is there anything about a DSLR that is better than a mirrorless? Because it sounds like they, the mirrorless does everything the DSLR does and also doesn't have the extra weight and all that other stuff. I really think you both are on the right track here. If I'm going speculation, I think you guys are hitting the nail right on the head. Both Nikon and Canon are putting out their own versions of a mirrorless camera. They've had one out on the market for a little while now. Though Sony hit their first and stronger. So both of them are a little bit behind in the big news of having mirrorless cameras. And you're right, these lenses that they're discontinuing are big, heavy, very expensive, professional lenses. They are going to continue to support them for a while. I think it was Canon that came out and said, hey, we will support this camera until we run out of parts because we're not making parts anymore, but we will still fix it as long as we have parts to fix it. But if the companies themselves are saying, okay, what the people want, what the professional photographers want, what our community that is still buying our stuff is interested in is these mirrorless systems. Of course, they're going to discontinue these really expensive lenses that are just for DSLRs and start focusing on what they can supply for these mirrorless systems. And the question that you brought up, Michael, is there any advantage to a DSLR over mirrorless anymore? I really don't think so. In the beginning days, 100%, I would have said yes, because of the heat generation as that sensor is always turned on so you can see what's going on. And the fact that there would be lines and flakiness in that display, that kind of stuff, really all of those hardware and software issues have been worked out. And if you want something, even as a professional, to shoot with, you're getting something lighter with the mirrorless. 
so you can pack it more places. It'll be lighter in general if you're using one of these gigantic lenses, just because your body itself is so much lighter. I really agree with both of you. You guys are learning something from Camera Corner. I yes. know we are finally, finally. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think about the small form factor of this mirrorless camera of the a6300, but also it was the video capabilities as well. I had tried to use a DSLR as my webcam in the past, which is something a lot of people were doing back when I started my YouTube channel probably four years ago. But the problem was that the video codecs or the video licenses that they bought, I guess, for the cameras in the DSLRs for your Canons and your Nikons only allowed them to shoot video for like 30 minutes. And that wouldn't work for the applications in the, in the shooting that I was doing. When you go into a mirrorless world with the Sony a6300, there's no limit. You can record video for as long as I have memory or the space to record it. Picture is extraordinarily clear. And it's super light, which means it's really easy for me to wield it if I'm doing it inside of a computer case or looking at parts, but also to hang it off of things. Or if I want to quickly take it to a sporting event because I want those nicer pictures with my kids, I can just grab it and throw it in a bag and go because it's so small. Completely different story with the DSLR. You've got to carry the extra lenses with you. Uh, you've got a much bigger body overall. The video's not so great on them. Uh, in comparison, there's just a lot of downsides, and I'm speaking from an amateur standpoint, in my opinion, to a DSLR compared to the mirrorless, which obviously these companies have to account for. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the reasons why the video isn't quite so good on a DSLR is because they aren't made to be on all of the time. And on a mirrorless system, they really are. So as you have video on, especially for long periods of time, or just using the live view on a DSLR, you'll start to notice that there's a little more grayness, a little more noise going into your image as that sensor heats up. I'm not entirely sure what they've done on the mirrorless side to kind of combat that, but there is a difference in technology as your mirrorless is made to be on, where the DSLR is made to be on when you hit the shutter button. So I guess the big question, Wendy, is will you be switching to mirrorless soon? I definitely have plans to be switching to mirrorless. I need to figure out what all of my stuff is worth so I can get it sold and jump on the mirrorless bandwagon because I've been ready there you for go. quite a while now. I think that answers everything you need to know right there. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, that's it. Our 32nd episode of Hardware Addicts is a wrap. Thank you for listening to the show that brings you your bi-weekly tech fix. If you're not all lit up on tech yet, you know what you need to do? You need to go check out all the amazing content on the Destination Linux network. Head right now. Open your browser. Go to destinationlinux.network. Check out all the amazing podcasts and YouTube partners available. There is so much to fill your brains with. Remember, there's no such thing as too much hardware. Build, learn, innovate, and grow. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next time for another ROG5 Ultimate episode of Hardware Addicts, where we take all the best parts of a podcast and jam it all together. But don't worry, each episode has an external fan to keep it cool. 